October 8th. Um, thank you to the members of the public for showing an interest in the process, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so DBRAC members have in their yellow folders is, uh, the documents that were also on the tables for folks as they came in for public comment. Um, I'm just going to walk through what all of these documents are, and then we'll go ahead and progress to these. So first is the agenda. Second is a packet of minutes that we need to adopt from our meetings on August 20th, September 10th, and the 17th. Um, third document is the voting tally from a vote that we conducted on uh, September 17th, which we'll explain a little bit in detail. Um, another document is the, the, the uh, answers from the exit slip questions that we asked in September. Then on the right side of the folder are, are some documents that we have right now. It's not the full set of documents that will be given by staff later this evening. Uh, so one PowerPoint is um, titled Guidance to District Staff Regarding the Soft Neighborhood Model. Uh, this presentation is a response to the dialogue that we had with the school board last week in advance of um, the board's action on adopting our, board, our framework for enrollment balancing. Uh, another document is the uh, updated version of the key performance indicators. Um, we got a preliminary draft in our meeting in September, but it was clear from the membership at that meeting that we wanted some clearer time to um, understand what these metrics are, how did our board adoption framework develop these indicators, and we'll get a sense later this evening in terms of how these indicators help us look at potential scenarios in the coming weeks. Um, additionally, we'll have some marketing and advertising materials that will that are actually um, that cover the broad timeline in terms of the community engagement activities and the timeline for DBRAC's process and the time that we'll hand over a recommendation to the superintendent and an overview of what the board process for community feedback in January and February will be. And then lastly, that is just in the folder, is one map, which is the current state of our existing system and the school boundaries. Just to clarify, the agenda item that is for 6 o'clock later this evening, when we're going to be talking about the KPIs, but also how to look at a scenario, that particular scenario has not been given to the committee yet or given to the public. Staff will be giving that to us momentarily when we reach that agenda item. So no one has seen it yet, and that's, I just wanted to make sure that that was the reason, just to clarify that that was not on the table yet for consideration. Um, so lastly, before, before we... Can you use the microphone? Yes, I will be more than happy. <laughs> Is this on? Yes. It's on? Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so the last thing that I think is the most important that I wanted to clarify is that one of our agenda items for this evening is taking a look at the key performance indicators that staff have identified that are based on the, the enrollment balancing framework that the board adopted on Monday. They have gone ahead and generated a dummy scenario, a scenario that is not under consideration. That map, they will, be give, they will give that formally to us at 6.10 or 6.15 when we start that agenda item. That's why it was not on the tables when you checked in. And additionally, GBRAC members have not even seen that map, myself included. So once we get to that agenda item, then everyone will receive that map for discussion later this evening. Um, before we get started, I wanted to clarify one piece of action that we took for, um, on the meeting on September 17th. So, Sarah, is that PowerPoint up and running? So I just wanted to do a quick walkthrough of what happened at last meeting. Okay. So as Sarah's queuing that up, one of the things I just wanted to clarify that happened in our meeting on September 17th is that one of the largest questions that has come out throughout this entire process from last November on till September was how does the boundary review process kind of incorporate other key decisions that the district has to make, for example, the discussion on grade configuration. So we know we have about 25 to 27 schools that are currently configured at K through 8 configurations. One of the questions that the communities have been asking us for a while is how will that kind of a decision timeline be incorporated into the, our process? So what the district did for us, uh, what we did on the 17th was we generated three options for how the DBRAC believes it wanted to move forward with that particular question. Option A was that the committee would only look at boundary review scenarios only. We would not take on the question of looking at other enrollment balancing elements like grade configuration. Option B was that as staff generated scenarios for us, that we would part, that, that DBRAC would collaborate with the district to figure out 
as we're assessing boundary, boundaries, we would take a look at how our boundary review framework and our enrollment balancing framework identify the schools for potential reconfiguration and what that reconfiguration would be. And we would assess the different scenarios and, say, and more or less say, what are the pros and cons to the different scenarios that the staff have generated for us? Option C was one step further than that, which was we would take a look at all of the scenarios, look at all of the different elements, which includes boundaries and grade configuration. And in addition to that, what we would choose to do is that we would take, any of the, take the scenarios that staff have generated for us, and then we would formally say, based on the scenarios that have been developed, we would say, of those, how many we believe are worthy of consideration for the superintendent to look at in December and January before she, afform, before she officially makes the recommend, her recommendation to the school board. At, on the meeting on the 17th, we started a vote. That vote conduct, was conducted for about a week and a half. And so what the committee has officially landed on is option C. So what that means is that going forward is that DBRAC will be partnering with the district to look at all elements of the balancing process, which includes the grade configuration discussion. So I just wanted to clarify that that was a vote that we started on the 17th, and that was the decision that we formally told the superintendent, and that's how we're going to proceed later this fall. Um, so before we move on, um, Jim, I'm going to hand it over to you to um, kind of talk about facilitation and um, our game plan for this evening. Uh, thank you, Jason. My name is Jim Jacks. I'm a facilitator. I work for Oregon Solutions at Portland State University. So uh, we've got a fair number of new faces to the room. Uh, so quick uh, show of hands if you've been in this building before. Uh, for those of you that haven't, the restrooms are kind of past the elevators around the corner. If there's anybody that needs childcare, we're doing it in that room right there. Uh, it does not appear that we need that. Uh, so a couple of things. Uh, one, no school boundary decisions are being made this evening. Um, DBRAC, this committee, does not make those decisions. The Board of Education does. Uh, the current schedule anticipates the board making a decision in January, uh, and this committee exists to provide advice to the superintendent. And DBRAC is mostly made up of citizen volunteers, uh, people like yourselves that were selected, and they have spent 58 hours in 23 previous DBRAC meetings learning about all the different factors that go into school boundary uh, decisions. And they've done a lot of homework outside the meetings, as they will tell you many times how much homework we've had them do. Uh, so there's 48,000 students, give or take, and more than 80 different schools at, at TPS in this district. And part of why I mention that is these citizen volunteers have learned a lot about how different those 80 different neighborhoods and buildings are. There's a lot of variety and a lot of diversity within this district. And so uh, one of the things DBRAC decided very early on is they wanted to create space for the public to have comments to them. And that has been a part of every meeting thus far. Uh, tonight, it's a little more challenging because we've got a bunch of people that like to provide comments. So and the other thing is this is a, a committee of volunteers and it's a working meeting for them. Uh, and Public comment is important, and there's other agenda items that we need to move through. <laughs> hey, Shannon. So uh, one key thing I'd like uh, people to remember is there are many opportunities between now and January for you and anyone else in the district to provide public comment as part of uh, these discussions and deliberations. And on the week of October 12th, the district will release a series of dates. I just checked it with Erin. She said it's the 12th. Um, they will release a series of dates about different uh, community forums uh, all over the district that are based on boundaries. And uh, there'll be a lot of information available about those forums, when and where they are, and how you can engage in that. Um, so one of the other... Um, so I want to talk about our public involvement uh, process at this point. So uh, if you want to verbally share your thoughts with DBRAC tonight, you have filled out a comment card, and I have them here. And it, uh, and it may be during the course of the meeting that you hear something that you would like to comment on or provide some thoughts or feedback about. 
Um, grab one of the sheets, uh, fill it out, and give it to Monin. Monin, can you raise your hand? She's right there. So if there's something that you hear at 7.50 that you want to comment about, write it down and give it to Monin, and that'll be part of the DBRAC record. So uh, a couple other things. Um, as a working committee of citizen volunteers, it's important that uh, respectful behavior is expected and appreciated. And especially for a large, a large crowd, some of you are very competent public speakers, very comfortable doing that, and some of you are not. And you all have your own thoughts and opinions that you want to share, and that's part of what this is for. And individual schools, individual neighborhoods can be very different. And DBRAC has heard a variety of opinions before. And it's likely we can, will continue to hear a variety of opinions. And this needs to be a safe place for everyone to share their different opinions. So the, um, the difficulty is we have uh, about 15 or 16 people that want to make some comments. And uh, Jason agreed to extend the public comment period time. And what I have is I have a timer. It's one minute. There's about 15 or 16 of us. Each of you will have one minute. And what I'd like to do is have people come up and just kind of form a line in the middle here and come to the mic. I'll call your name. And I'll be sitting right here. And I'll have the timer. And you've got about a minute. Uh, and thank you. Looks like one more. <coughs> Uh, and you'll have about a minute. And remember, this is not your last chance. This is like the first chance of 50 that you'll have between now and whatever decision the board makes in January. Um, so I'm delighted that you're here. You care about your kids. You care about the community. You could be doing something else with your Thursday night. Uh, and the good news is we have a committee full of citizens who have volunteered a lot of Thursday nights since November of last year trying to educate themselves about complicated uh, and complex uh, topics. So, uh, all right, so at this point, I'm gonna call about the first five names, and if you can come up and just kind of make a row here in the aisle, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Um, Anthony Droga, Stephen Liang, Hannah Lee, and Cheryl Langford. Uh, Anthony, please. Oh, and if you have something you want me to hand out to the committee, just hand it to me. Uh, thank you, and uh, Stephen Lee. the district 
district enrollment rebalance. I strongly, strongly recommend that the committee member review the school redistricting work from other school districts across the nation in the past to better understand how important the community and neighborhood value is to protect the building block of our city and community. Sending kids across the town to other neighborhood schools by extended travel does not solve the enrollment balancing issue in the long run. In contrast, this will cause other unplanned social challenges and problems. One of these is the tearing down of the local community and neighborhood. I'm sure this is not the result this committee intended to see as part of the rebalancing effort. I ask you to, to be very sensitive to this community and neighborhood issue when you go through this boundary rebalancing process. Thank you for your listening. Thank you. So, Hannah Lee. Hannah Lee. I want to applaud TPS uh, for your noble cause to bring equity and important public school systems. But having said that, um, have you considered the consequences, the real consequences, um, and all the dominant effects upon uh, boundary changes? Uh, for example, just changing boundary lines is not going to solve the overcrowding integration and quality of education problems. It's not all about placing students, but creatively into building the schools where they are needed, and training teachers to teach better in their current students by channeling funding differently, and how parents and students will panic, and it will cause uncertainty um, to our community. And then they consider what us parents actually want, and what our needs are, what our students needs are before we go ahead and make this Thank you. So uh, we'll have Cheryl and then Richard Jolly, Kisong Yu, and then uh, Stephen Fortman. observation I'd like to make with the group is um, agreeing with the speaker is important and you're free to do that and sometimes for other people who might have a differing opinion that might be a little intimidating for them to share a different opinion and our warm applause takes longer so uh, I'm going to encourage the group to maybe just if somebody says something you like just clap twice that way you're able to show that and we're able to move briskly along. Uh, Mr. Richard Jolly. Thanks. First, I want to uh, thank the volunteer groups here for your time. I appreciate it, helping our kids out. Um, with the increasing awareness of an inevitable large earthquake on the Cascadia subduction zone 
and the understanding that our Portland bridges will be severely damaged in this event, why has the DBRAC committee decided to deprioritize the KVI of promoting safer routes to schools? Thank you. Thank you. Let's practice. Everybody clap twice. <laughs> so we'll just clap for everybody. Uh, Mr. Kisangu. Stephen Fortman, and then Allison Worthington, and Jennifer Silo. Silo. Allison, thank you. Hi, my name is Allison Worthington. I have two children and they attend Beverly Cleary School. I'm here tonight on behalf of our school community, hoping for a resolution to our current three campus situation due to overcrowding. Being split on the three campuses was supposed to be a one year mandate. However, this is our second year at it, and now we foresee this happening again next year. Being split up has been difficult on our entire school community. From a personal perspective, my kids are in elementary school, and even though only one grade apart, they have been on separate campuses three years running, which makes pick up and drop off challenging. Sorry, I'm not good at public school. Additionally, each child has moved campuses the last three years, and if the family stays in place, they will each move again next year. Four years in a row, separate schools from each other, and on a different campus every year. All of this when we live walking distance from the main campus. Please resolve this as soon as possible. It's hard living in limbo, never knowing what's happening year to year. Thank you for listening. Not everybody has to be a Toastmaster to be successful at this. Oh, I'm sorry. And next speaker is Laura Hadiat and Jeffrey. First, with all the rumors that have been swirling around recently, it's going to have huge impact 
happens until the data comes out and the boundaries have been decided on foundation giving to schools this year. There are a lot of schools in Portland Public Schools who give a lot to their foundations which support not only teaching positions in their schools, but a third of that those foundation funds are given to the all hands raised, all hands raised fund, which goes to other schools and Portland Public Schools that don't have the means to raise their own funds. The second unintended financial consequence would be the cost of busing children across Portland in the mornings and in the evenings and the cost of paying for that. The third unintended consequence is the cost of friendship, not only with the children, but between the parents and the rights that this will cause to the communities that are very closely knit with the Portland Public School District. Another cost this will have is families that currently have financial means but right now, believe in Portland Public Schools, and I think they're going to turn out correctly, have the financial means that they can pull their children out of Portland Public Schools. That is going to have a financial consequence and impact to foundation giving, which again, a third of that gives, goes to um, all hands raised and goes to schools who don't raise a lot for their foundation. And the sixth financial impact, and the most important one, is most families who have children in Portland Public Schools, their biggest financial asset is their home. The property values of people's homes from arbitrarily changing boundaries is going to have a significant financial impact, both increasing and decreasing and staying neutral. And I'm not sure that any of us have the economic background or the financial education to be making those sort of decisions. Thank you very much. So, uh, Layla? Mr. Jeffrey. Jeff, yeah. So first of all, good evening. Thank you, everybody, for, for taking the time. I think we can all agree this is an incredibly difficult topic. Um, I think you're just starting to see the emotions that are coming into play. So I'll try to be brief. Basically, there's four points I wanted to make. One, I do think that we need to absolutely factor in the concepts of natural disasters into the rebalancing. I've lived through two massive earthquakes in Northridge, personally. I lived through the Bay Bridge earthquake, personally. I know what it's not like to be able to get to my parents and have to stay at school. And I want to make sure and ensure that the district is ready to provide the care 24-7 until I can get to my kids. I guarantee I can walk from my house to anywhere on that side of the river and get to my kids in a day. The second piece I really want to bring up to everybody here is to ensure the consistency of the special educational programs that have been put into place. Uh, very specifically, the only thing that has been consistent for my two kids at Skyline, so I, I forgot, I did not say where I'm from. I'm from the rural community of Skyline. Um, the one thing that has been consistent through incredibly difficult situations, I think everybody knows what those are, has been the IB program. My kids buy into the IB program, they enforce those concepts into their everyday activities. And I want to ensure that they have the ability as they move through high school to continue those pieces on. The last piece that I did want to bring up to everybody else was, of course, uh, timelines. And that's it. I'll be done. Uh, we've already slipped two weeks on the proposed boundaries. Please take a very deep thought on making sure that you're extending time for communities to review the plan. The most important part about these meetings is to remove the emotion. If you allow people to take time, plan to work together as a community, please extend this out so we can prepare logical, well-founded arguments that certainly are not focused on attack. So thank you for the time. Thank you. 
So uh, we do have other people that signed up and we're already about 10 minutes over when we were supposed to end this agenda item. Um, so I want to encourage uh, several things. Uh, as I said before, there are many opportunities between tonight and when the board makes some decision in January. Uh, and there will be a series of uh, civic engagement activities by the district around boundaries uh, that will be occurring in October and November and I think even in December. Uh, and that schedule will get released the week of October 12th. So there are many times and places still to weigh in. And of course, DBRAC will uh, have a meeting October 29th. There's two scheduled in November and one scheduled in December. Um, so at this point, I want to transition to our next agenda item to uh, a, a significant content piece for tonight. Oh, Judy is reminding me, should we approve minutes? Yes. All right, so um, members got copies in my emails this week and also have hard copies available to them. Um, meeting minutes from August 20th, September 10th, and September 17th. Uh, so I'm just going to give a quick two minutes or so for folks to look at them to make sure that you want to make sure that they're correct or offer any proposed amendments. And uh, when members are done, if you could either put your name card standing up or raise a green card so I know that you're done, that would be helpful. Okay, thank you very much, members. All right, so um, we're going to go ahead and hopefully begin the process to adopt these. So for the meeting notes on August 20th, are there any changes or amendments? <coughs> Seeing none, with that, um, all those in favor of adopting the notes from August 20th, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? All right, meeting notes for the 20th approved. Meeting notes for September 10th, any changes or proposed amendments? None? All right. All those in favor of adopting, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Meeting notes for the 10th approved. And lastly, meeting notes for the 17th. And just also to add really quick, there's a second sheet in your folder that looks like a, um, an Excel spreadsheet, which is the roll tally of the votes. So that will be included in the final version that gets distributed and posted online. Um, so with that, are there any changes or amendments to the meeting notes for the 17th? None. All those in favor of adopting, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? All right, meeting notes for the 17th approved. With that, thank you very much. I'm going to turn it back over to Judy. And I'm only taking the mic to give Sarah Singer a moment to get up here. What we're going to do now is take you through some content areas. Um, we're going to use the screen. Hopefully you can see it well. Sorry that these chairs don't pivot like the ones upstairs, but take a second to get yourselves comfortable. And um, thanks for being here tonight.
circulating among the advocates. Thank you. Sasha? There's a packet for a uh, Thank you, Judy. Okay, so my name is Sarah Singer. I'm a Senior Director of System Planning and Performance. And um, with me is also Sean Helm. And Sean Helm is a Senior Manager in our department and um, also one of the technical leads on this project. Oops. Okay, so what um, I'm gonna do is talk in very concrete terms tonight about what is a scenario. Um, so we've sort of told you what a scenario is in the abstract, but I'm gonna show you some pictures of what is literally our ideas of what are in a scenario. Um, I'm also gonna present draft key performance indicators. And so these are, these are the um, measures that we will use to assess those scenarios. And then, um, I am looking for, we are looking for feedback on a couple of things. The key performance indicators um, is, as we know, they're, they're still in draft form. And then the other piece, and this is really important because I've done this for quite a while, and one of the things that I have learned is you have the technical side of these projects, and that's the production of the numbers and making sure the analysis is right. And then you have to be able to package and communicate all of that analysis, which can be incredibly complex. And so I, what we were doing tonight is I want to get feedback literally on the packaging of how we've communicated um, some pretty complicated concepts. And then lastly, we're gonna review what we've called a sample or a dummy scenario, and Judy Brennan's gonna walk through that. So that's, that's, the, that's what we're doing. is going to be for the scenarios. Um, as you all know, you've got public comment cards, so if there's anything in terms of how to read the scenario that just doesn't make sense or ways that we could help explain this data better to families in a couple of weeks, write that down and indicate it on the card so we can take that back to staff so they can hopefully incorporate it. That would be really helpful for us. Thanks, Jason. Okay, so what's the scenario? So we have, um, so scenarios are plans for ingest, adjusting enrollment so that in the coming years we can manage the growth that we know is coming and that we can ensure program access for all of our students will help us to ensure excellent schools. Um, these scenarios take into account enrollment forecasts um, and they are based on DBRAC's values framework and current policy, so current board policy and administrative directive. So in terms of what you might expect to see in a scenario, um, one of the things that, um, as we were thinking through how to report this information, um, one of the challenges that we came across is that it's actually, there's a lot of variables here. So if you think about the, uh, what could change, you, you could have boundaries changing at the K-5 level, you could have um, assignments changing at the 6-8 level, you could have change, assignments changing at the high school level. Um, uh, you could have other things changing as well. And so what what this can do is it can be very complicated to actually um, process. The human brain might have trouble sort of processing that many changes on one map. So what we have thought of in terms of a package uh, when relevant is to actually do sort of three different maps. So you would have a map with only K-5 changes outlined and then only 6-8 changes and then, and then uh, potentially high school and then eventually a map with all of the changes. So that's, that's just to sort of help people um, be able to access this information better. So that would be in a scenario. The other thing that needs to be in a scenario is what happens to individual schools. So you want to know what happens to X school in very specific terms. And so we have to produce maps for every single school for all of the scenarios. So if there's, um, uh, you know, four scenarios produced, 
let's say that we were, there were 70 schools impacted, that would be 280 maps needing to be produced. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot that goes into building a scenario. Um, the, we envision that being sort of a web-based product as opposed to a big booklet. We also have these, um, uh, what we're calling story maps, and this is on our website right now, actually. But some people learn better through sort of narrative. They want complete sentences. Um, and so what you can find on our website right now is um, versions of these story maps. Um, but as the process continues, we will add our scenarios to these what we call story maps. And so there'll be a like, verbiage that goes along with um, the maps and it explains the changes. Okay, and so also in a scenario, we have what we call key performance indicators. And so these are the most kind of, these are the critical metrics to assess scenarios. And um, KPIs um, should, we believe that good KPIs should be able to be comparable across scenarios, so using some sort of consistent measurement, um, that they're relevant to our current context, that they're possible to generate repeatedly, and that the output that they generate is accurate, and um, that they're few in number, that we don't have 90 of these because that's a, very difficult for people to process, and that they're accessible to the general public, meaning that people can understand them. So we don't have um, something that's uh, too difficult or too complicated for people to process. So um, that's what's in a scenario, in our, at least in our minds, we're open to feedback. So that would be, again, system level maps, it would be individual school maps, it would be key performance indicators, and then this last piece, I'm just calling other analysis, but we're gonna be, we're gonna need to have some sort of reporting mechanism to compare scenarios across each other. So we're gonna need that. Um, just to reiterate, completion of actual scenarios is still in process. So tonight, again, this is all um, a dummy scenario, it's a sample scenario, and the, and, the, and the stuff that we hand out um, around the packaging is also, um, we're literally testing it to see does this make sense? Does this read okay to you? Can you, um, as a, an important body in this process, do you feel that you can understand this information so that you can make a recommendation? Okay, so I'm gonna, that was my summary of what's in a scenario in, in the most concrete way I can make it. Um, I'm gonna go in depth now on the topic of key performance indicators. And so um, I think there's been some questions about this, uh, you know, how were they developed? Um, how, did, how did we come up with them? And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So the first thing to note is that they are aligned to, the bo to board policy and the current administrative directive. So I wanna be really specific about this. So the board already has an existing policy. It's 4.10.045-P, student assignment to neighborhood schools. So there, this is an existing policy, um, and that's sort of the, in a very, it's kind of brush strokes. It's the what of student assignment. But then we also, the staff has to take that, PPS staff have to take that policy, and we have to sort of make that work. We have to implement that. And that's the how, and we do that through something called an administrative directive. And so this administrative directive is based off that policy. So we looked at that when we, when we um, developed these KPIs. And then um, the next thing that happened, and you all probably are, remember this, but in your DBRAC values framework, you looked at these policies. And you made some edits to them. And so in your DBRAC values framework, you had, there was sort of a table at the very end, and there's some red writing, and we accepted that all those changes, and so the KPIs were developed off of that version of the um, administrative directive. So that's sort of how they align. Staff developed and then prioritized a set of, of items to further refine into KPIs, and this is an important point. So we also differentiated between what we're calling a global KPI and a situational metric. And so um, a, a global KPI is something that's gonna be measured for every scenario, and it's gonna be sort of on that packaging. And we're gonna hand out an example of that, of that packaging tonight, so you can see what that looks like. 
And then there's something called a situational metric, and these are reported on a case-by-case -case basis for affected schools and or scenarios. And so, um, so there are many instances where we feel that you, um, some of these metrics are better suited for specific scenarios or when you're looking at sp like specific regions of, um, of the city, that sort of thing, and that would be a situational metric. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, actually I'm gonna back up for a second. So you have in your folders, I'm gonna grab this if that's okay, uh, this is a detailed document, and you saw a version of this last time. This has been updated um, based on some feedback, and um, this is, this lists what's a global KPI, what's a situational metric, and then it also defines for you in greater detail how some of those um, either situational metrics or KPIs are derived, okay? So um, and what I'm gonna do now is tell you which KPI staff sort of recommends to be global or globalized. So the first one is all neighborhood schools operate with at least two sections per grade level. So what we know is that um, front and center of this process, you guys have been so clear that access to a strong core program is essential. And it's, it's, one, of the dri it's one of the drivers. It's mentioned repeatedly in your values framework. And so this is a way to basically measure. If you have less than two sections per grade level in, the, in grades K through eight, we think it's much more challenging for those schools to offer a strong academic core program. And I know we've kind of gone through the whys on that in previous meetings. Um, and so this is uh, a metric really about um, getting at that. Another one is the reduction in number of schools that are over capacity. So we don't want schools to be busting at the seams, to be overcrowded. Um, and so that is, um, I, th I think that's a sort of an obvious one, but I just want to, to me, this is a, a, um, a incredibly critical one. Um, so I'm gonna do the third one here. Fewer middle schools and high schools have split feeder patterns. So what this would mean is if I'm a middle school student and I have a friend who's, my friend is in that same middle school, that we don't then feed to two different high schools, that we feed to the same high school. Um, so that's what, um, that's what that means, or K-5 students feeding to the same middle school. Um, another one is awareness of racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic distributions at every school. Um, so this is one that we would report at, ev on every single, at every single school. Um, and we think it's um, critical to be, uh, have a kind of eyes wide open when we make any change that we understand the racial the socioeconomic um, and um, ethnic impacts that that might have at that school. Um, and so um, if you, I think what we're saying here is have your wi eyes wide open, know what's happening, and then once you know what's happening, you would then apply a racial equity lens to, to determine whether that was a good or a bad thing or who was disadvantaged or advantaged. Awareness of number of schools that are deemed high, medium, and low poverty. So this is another one. And this one aligns, if for those people who um, are into the board policy, these align to, there's one about diversity. And so four and five are, are aligned to that. Um, and so this is, like I said, number of schools deemed low, medium, and high poverty. We're using something called direct certification as our measurement for economic disadvantage. More students attend schools within closer walking distance to their homes. So this is about proximity. This is also about na keeping neighborhoods together. Um, and so um, this is um, uh, measured in uh, miles. Fewer students is, um, reassigned to new schools. So we talked about limiting student disruption or impact. And then this one is fewer students who are directly affected by recent enrollment balancing changes that are be then being subject to new changes. So you guys have talked a lot as a committee about certain communities in Portland repeatedly um, being uh, reassigned or having some sort of change in that community. And so this is actually a, more of a qualitative metric. So this is one where with every scenario, 
we would literally list which schools who have had recent changes um, and are also being impacted by this scenario. So these are the, the, the KPIs that we uh, would put on every single scenario and compare across scenarios. That's the proposal. Um, and again, the summary here is um, we think global KPIs really need to be comparable. They need, you know, can you be used across every scenario? They need to be feasible and accurate. So can they be repeatedly generated? Is the resulting output actually accurate? And is it measuring what it's intended? Um, is it relevant? So is it, in that case, is it aligned to, with the DBRAC framework or the intent of the DBRAC framework? Um, is it measuring our current problem areas, um, given our current context? Um, and then in terms of accessibility, we would argue that if you have too many of these things, it becomes almost inaccessible. And, um, and we want to make sure that the metrics that we land on are something that um, the average parent um, could understand. And another really important point is that all of these um, key performance indicators um, will be disaggregated by historically underserved racial groups and socioeconomic status. We also have situational metrics, and so some of these uh, would include more schools operating within preferred facility capacity utilization ranges, um, neighborhood schools operating within preferred enrollment ranges given their configuration, fewer students needing to be bused, uh, minimizing expenses related to modifications of facilities. Enrollment ranges within similar configurations um, are minimized. So that's really around enrollment parity, if that makes sense. So you don't want one um, giant K-8 and a really small K-8, so that's what that means. Um, awareness when special education-focused classrooms are relocated. More students having safe routes to schools as determined by the transportation department. And then more neighborhood association boundaries aligned with school boundaries. Okay, so that's the KPI document. And I want to walk you through, do they have the little, do they have that one? I don't know if they do. Okay. All right, well, maybe I'll just open it up for clarifying questions at this point. So the, Sarah, what triggers uh, the use of situational metrics compared to the global? Um, it, it, it's hard to predict at this point in time, but it, it could be um, it could be like an isolated, I mean, I'm making this up, but it could be train tracks or something in a particular area or a really unsafe road in a particular area. And so we would look at that. It would be those kind of things. You have, do you have any examples, Sean? So that, that's what comes to mind. These are sort of hard to predict, but we, we know they're going to come up. So this, yep. this gives us the ability to drill down into these other metrics where it's just apparent that the globals don't tell the whole story. Exactly. And I think that like a really good, especially around like the racial equity work, like that's the one that really comes to mind for me. Um, so a school may have gotten more diverse, but now we've completely isolated the one black student in that school that's now technically more diverse. So like it's those kind of... Um, those kind of things where I think you just need to look at it situationally. Yeah. Uh, I had a question about the last one in the previous slide, the global KPIs. <laughs> yeah. I had in my head that some of the community feedback we got. Repeat the questions. I had it in my head that some of the community feedback we got that some of these communities that were affected more recently by some of these changes weren't happy about those changes and really would welcome more changes if they went in a different direction. So I'm not sure if number eight really uh, is something, it's certainly, certainly something we want to think about. Yeah, I think that's really good feedback. Like, you're absolutely right on that. I think maybe just we might change that to be awareness. It's similar to what Yeah. 
school communities who were affected recently and they really didn't like the changes that they were affected by and they want to change again. And so that it's, um, that, wait, wait, wait. That was exactly it. I don't, I don't think that's necessarily a global KPI the way it's written. Correct. And so there were recommendations to change it to existing, or I suggested, existing fewer students more of uh, awareness of when changes happen to such a school communities. <coughs> So I guess, you hear me? Um, so this isn't really a question, but more of a comment. So I see the first KPI, um, schools operate with at least two sections per grade level. Um, and I completely understand what that means. I think, Sarah, uh, your presentation about how schools, the percentage of schools or what school configuration allows the individual schools to operate um, only using their core funding. I'm not exactly sure of the language you used, but I think it would be really interesting to know in the different scenarios how many of the schools are able to do that in each scenario so that they can, I don't know if this is possible, so that we're sure, you said that this is like one of these core equity metric understanding, and so I just didn't know, I know it's related to that, but I don't know that it aligns, and I don't know if it's possible and meets your other criteria, but I think it would be interesting to understand, you know, as we change, how many of these schools have the capacity from a numbers perspective to meet that objective that you outlined? Does that make sense? It, yes, Oh, that's good, because mine's related um, to what Pamela just said. I, um, oh, should I wait? Okay. Um, back in a couple meetings ago when you presented the enrollment ranges and the section information, I'm just wondering why you picked the two versus the three sections, because the three sections I thought you had said was the more robust um, way to uh, weather enrollment fluctuations. And I just wondered. We could do both. We chose, um, there's not many schools can do their sections, so that's part of it. Um, but we, I mean, more with it. So, Sarah, I have a question, and it's in relation to, I think it's the combination of the global KPI number six and then the situational metric that kind of, it's the metric that basically talks about um, proximity. And so one of the things that I see it and I totally understand it, but I, I think more I'm caught up is on one hand, yeah, there's, you know, students walk to school, but for me, how does actual drive time for um, students from their house to a particular school catch up? So, for example, like me living in North Portland, on one hand, I can get from my house to one school, like, drive time in, like, maybe 10 minutes, but during rush hour, it takes me at least 30 to 35. And so when you're talking about commute time in relation to getting your kid to schools, how do, how do those KPIs, either in this instance, help factor that in, et cetera, because I get it, I'm, that's the part where I'm stuck.
What people do with that distance is extremely situational. So we're starting with distance to, because we believe that that's universal. There may be certain places where when we really get down to a certain kind of change, time is a critical factor. That's, that's an example of where we can dig deeper okay. to check on an individual type of change. And I would just add one more thing. Um, when we did high school system design, we initially did look at time as, an, as a, a key metric, and it did some really interesting things to the maps um, because of just, we actually used like TriMet time, and, we, and, it, and it, it actually resulted in nonsensical maps. So. Thank you, Jason. So what, uh, did you have a clarifying question, Michelle? Um, the, uh, my question was about also the global KPI. Oh, good, you moved it back, number two. Um, are we gonna track the schools that are under capacity? You have a reduction in the number of schools that are over capacity. But what about the ones? We also want to reduce the number of schools that are under enrolled. Is that something you'll look at? So we have that as a situational metric. Um, I will say we think that if you're below two sections per grade, there's a good chance you're going to be under enrolled. Not necessarily, but a good chance. So there is that. And it's also pretty difficult to land at a number, like a capacity utilization percentage that people can agree to that equals under enrollment. So, that, so there was sort of some challenges with defining that. So that's why we think that if you take um, the two sections per grade, um, you, get, you at least get at part of that. So over, adding the word over and under. And I saw Aaron nod her head. So, um, so we're, Judy? note that uh, I just wanted the committee to understand that so Aaron Barnett is taking detailed notes on all of your comments because we really do um, think this is a great opportunity for us to improve the product so thank you so uh, we're at the stage for uh, Michael uh, is this uh, so what's coming next is committee feedback uh, warm feedback for positive things and then we'll do cool feedback for concerns is this a feedback piece or a clarifying question piece so let's, I, yeah, my opinion is if we have enough kids to have the educational model we're looking for, which is the two and ideally three uh, sections per grade, and we don't have, and we have buildings that can satisfy that, I'd be worried if we were over capacity because then you have a building problem. If you have some that are under capacity, I don't think that's a problem. I think that's an opportunity if we have a problem somewhere else and we may want to keep an eye on it, but I don't think it's a KPI that we really, it's not a key performance indicator that indicates a problem. If we have enough kids for our core program and we have plenty of space, that's not a problem. If we have enough kids and we don't have enough space, then that really is a problem. So I think that's, I think that's the way to look at that. Yep, thank you. Which I think is what we're trying to actually get at up here. So that's, that's sort of how it's written, what you just said. Okay. Feedback. What do you like? What's working for you? What are you glad that you see? Committee members? Positive, warm comments? Oh, green cards are lovely too. If you just generally think you're. I mean, if, if you feel like uh, this is going in the right track, uh, generally speaking, go ahead and put up a green card. If you think it is going on the wrong track, put up a red card. Uh, and if you have some questions and concerns, maybe put up a yellow card. Green, right track. Red, wrong track. Yellow, some questions and concerns. So I want to check in quick with the three yellows, starting with Jason. So I go back to my original comment on the, the drive time, the distance. And I guess one of the things I'm wondering is, I guess in terms of trying to re reduce the amount of walk time, et cetera, the one thing I'm wondering is, I guess when you're generating your scenarios, are you, I guess I'm getting very technical here, which is, 
are you putting in things like a child should have to walk no more than X blocks or a family should have to drive no more than X miles? Is that an appropriate ask? Or I guess that's the one thing that I guess I'm leaving a little unclear. And I guess it's the person who drove and bus to school for a number of years. It's just what I'm wondering. Alice. I don't really have a concern per se. I guess um, for me it would be good to spend a little bit of time talking <clears throat> with a group um, here before giving feedback because I feel like I just it would I would welcome that process time. Uh, Pamela. I guess I think I, I just want maybe I'm reiterating but this idea of um, sections know, the, the interplay between sections, buildings and program. I know we at boundary doesn't address program because that's a building specific thing, but how we, if there's a way to sort of either break apart or link, you know, um, sections, which is an indicator of funding essentially, right? So how programs, how robust, how will this impact the robustness of, of the potential program offering? And I don't know how you create a KPI out of that, but if there's an ability to do that, I think it would be helpful. I think there is through, um, I, I mean, I think we can track like three section K-8s, two section K-8s. We can look at how many, because those roughly cor correlate with, with, exact, with having that um, core program that we've talked about, or we can use those preferred enrollment ranges. So we said specifically if you're in um, an enrollment range and you're a K-8 of between 330 and 360, we think you're, you're you're going to have a better chance of being able to provide that core program. And at K-8, I don't have them memorized off the top of my head, but there was an enrollment range that way. And that's a situational metric, but we could elevate it and, and we could re report it on a, as a global basis if that's, is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, I think it's, it's more to make it clear to the end user that those things tie, right? It's not that the, that the, that the KPIs aren't embedded in them and they don't result in that outcome, but in general, people who may not be aware that this number translates to oh, I why, see or this many section translates to why. So if there's a way to, you would ask for like presentation, feedback, elucidation. That's, I think, the piece that for me is missing is not that they're not embedded here from a technical perspective, but they may not be transparent to as we go through the process. So if there was a header that said sufficient enrollment to support core program. Okay. Yep. <laughs> uh, Sheldon, next. Oh, I uh, think I'm again like, having the same thing as Pamela. Um, so that the KPIs are really pulled right out of the administrative directive, which is part of the framework, and they are very technical and they are kind of a one-to-one -one match with that, which is good. But I'm trying to think of. Well, I am thinking of non administrative directive language types of things we might be concerned about that are broader, um, like is this a stable system or is this a good way to manage growth? How, how well is it doing in sort of these big picture ideas? And, and to what Pamela was saying, how do we know it's ensuring the access that we've talked about? And so, um, I don't have really a recommendation. I'm just kind of got you with the link between the directive and the KPIs, but I'm trying to link it to the bigger picture of our framework, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's a way to do it. I just don't think it's very clear. So I'll just say that um, we're, gonna, we're going to be showing you the sample scenario in a moment, and we've been working really closely with the comms team including people right behind you there, to help humanize these concepts. Okay. When you get a look at that, let's come back to whether that helps address your question. I know Maxine. Uh, Maxine. Thank you. Um, looking at number five, 
no, number four and number five, and it talks about awareness. And I just need to know, um, how is awareness an indicator? What, what action happens beyond being aware? Did I, somebody ask that question already? So I think that with these, with these two, I'm going to say four and five, um, those two KPIs deserve a lot of thought. So um, I think the first step is when you make a change, we should be able to identify um, how it impacted um, our students and all of our students and all of our um, all of our historically underserved students specifically. And um, then from there, I think it deserves an attention of using like an equity lens to say, is this a good thing or a bad thing now that I have the context? So I can think of some examples in history where we have said, I'll just give some concrete examples. Like we, uh, throughout history in the United States education policy, they said, let's try to diversify schools and specifically um, how that got operationalized is um, you might have had a school with a thriving um, and happy African-American student population and then um, say there were 50 students and they all got dispersed, all those students got dispersed in groups of two to 20 different schools. Those school, a KPI can be dangerous here because a KPI it, depending on how it's worded, may have said, this is a good thing because our schools or our system is now more diverse. But if you ask those individual families and those individual students, was this a good thing for me? I'm not so sure they would have said that. And, I, and I've been in enough meetings now and talking to enough people that I know that, that even in Portland that this has been uh, something that has happened. I think that's why you have to look at the scenario, you have to, you have to assess the impacts of it, individually, and then this group wrestles with, is that a good thing, is that a bad thing, who is disadvantaged by this change, who is advantaged by this change, and so forth. So that's why it's written that way. But it's not, it's not, it's not active. It's not any action associated with It doesn't, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have like um, a value judgment in and of itself like the others do. Like this is fewer and that says fewer. It doesn't have that. So, uh, both Margaret and Joe want to weigh in. Right. It's interesting. So uh, another way to phrase that would be for both of them, equitable results uh, are accomplished, blah, blah, blah. Because that's what, that's what Sarah is saying and a little bit. I think we're not wanting to put a metric on it. We're going to say we're all going to have to evaluate it with the equity lens. Is that so? This is that, that. That's what I hear from this. I don't know if it works or not, but that's what I hear. So I think that um, situ situational metrics have a similar thing around special education. It's awareness, and um, so I think it's a question, it's the same question, Maxine, that I had as we were looking through. Everything else is directional or there's a, an all or nothing or a reduction or fewer. And this is just an acknowledgement, perhaps. So to me, it begs the question, is this a relative statement, right? So is it relative to current state? Is it relative, like, so what is the piece about it? Um, I think the racial equity policy and the racial equity lens will help. But I would like to see more of that language in this then um, as we go through um, to look at what that looks like. That you can say what is the impact, who is impacted, um, and that sort of thing that will uh, drill down a little bit deeper. Uh, it may make for too many global P KPIs, I don't know. But um, it's, a, it's the, the part of it being soft, I guess the concern I have is that it becomes a judgment. Right, and so this is part of, um, and feels different in a quantitative way. If it's much more qualitative, um, and it's just awareness. So um, I don't know. It'd be helpful that there's a little more framework around that. Uh, Hector, and then Alice. 
So, first of all, I think a qualitative measurement is not a bad idea. And I think you can make it actionable if you do put in language what you will do with that awareness. Awareness of, so that. So I think we can make it an actionable um, item. Because awareness is, gee, it's nice to know, but if you say, so that we can then. And to me, this, these two do not lend themselves to technical solutions. You need to have conversations. And, and the racial equity lens is actually a series of questions that puts you in conversations with the people impacted and by the communities that are impacted. So I was just going to say, not as eloquently, the same thing. And so maybe it's so that we will not um, further um, negatively impact communities that have been historically negatively impacting PBS. And that's the first question on the racial equity lens. Chase. So I wanted to follow up on Margaret's comment on the situational metric when it's talking about um, awareness when special education focused classrooms are relocated. So I'm going to channel like my time both on SACA and my conversations with Scott Bailey, which is I think when we're talking about our underserved stu students and communities or ones that have been impacted the most, one of the things that we learned over time was that it's our students that are in the special education ca classrooms who need the most stability. To me, that language suggests that like, you're setting up for if they're going to be relocated again. So for me, in communities we're trying to add stability when they needed to try and improve their chances for success. I mean, I, the language to me isn't strong enough. I'd like to find a way to something. Like, we're minimizing the number of classrooms that may be displaced. Something like that. Um, as a suggestion. I don't know if you can do that or not or what. But. Sasha. I think that one for me is a good example of this conversation because I, I think when you say, when you use that exact one, let's say minimize the number of moves, you've set a course which may, may or may not be the best thing for a group of kids in a certain circumstance. So if we say less moves and a closer, better facility, which the community would love, is now not considered because we've kind of we framed ourselves out of it. I think, I think there's a middle path somewhere along here, and I really appreciate the effort, and I do think it needs another iteration somehow, but uh, I think that's, for me, that's where that struggle was. The other thing, the other thing on that one is we're not, we, when we do these, we have to compare them to something, and so this is the challenge on this one, because like, if we compare it to the current state, and then we, we move, like, the current state isn't ideal on this one at all. So that was one of the other challenges for us on this particular one. Yeah, I think this, this one would really lend itself to the same approach that Hector suggested on the previous one. It's awareness so that we can minimize negative impacts on this particular population. I think might be a good way to address that. That's good, that's something. <laughs> Other comments, concerns before we move forward? Okay, so does that, all right. I'm gonna hand it to Judy Brennan. Okay, so now I feel like this is the big unveiling moment, but um, what we'd like to do now is go ahead and pass out this document, which I think is sequestered somewhere on some table, like that one. Yes, and I believe that we have enough for all of our committee members and for all in the public. So we'll, um, there's some that are starting in the back there, and we're going to take a minute to. Um, and so what I was hoping, um, Richard Martin, is that we could actually pull it up on here because I don't have the front page on here. I know, but I need. To, okay, so then I need to unplug for a sec and, and load that. And um, would you mind? Uh, I mean, escape, and then. Um, so we're just going to give you a second to um, get the document in front of you, and then um, I, I want to reiterate again that 
This is basically a training exercise. We have worked very hard to create something very dumb, um, a dummy, that um, we can use to both test our ability to show complicated information in a set of information that is useful and understandable. And you're gonna let us know where we've succeeded or where we need more work on that. And then an opportunity to talk about a set of changes and explain them in ways that make sense. Test whether these KPIs indeed provide the information that you're looking for. So to do that, um, I've got some slides that are an overview and I've also got, I think I'd just like to go off the main document there. So um, does everybody or almost everybody have a copy in front of them? Okay. Um, I have got to take a moment to ask you committee members to help me acknowledge the enormous team of people who have worked extremely hard to turn a product around in very short order. And that product is what you see. It's the fact that you can hear. It's the fact that there's space and we haven't violated the biomarshal codes, I don't think. Um, and it's the fact that if you would, you know, so there's a lot of facts that are different than a standard DBRAC meeting. So if we could just start by taking a moment to acknowledge that. Thank you. Good to be back. Thank you. Okay. So um, you can see that it's a sample right across it. What we're trying to do here is give you a chance to get oriented in what this is and create something that's accessible for people who don't have the um, detailed knowledge base that you have developed over low these many months. Okay, so information about what's next on the schedule, why we're doing this, you're the District Wide Boundary Review Advisory Committee, what your role is in this. We've developed this sample submit scenario for your discussion. This is not a real scenario. We would not take this scenario out um, and ask you, um, the community, to consider it seriously. It's just, it's highly flawed, but um, it's a good starting point, and again, a training tool. There are some things that we intentionally decided to build into this scenario, and we want to describe those up here to orient you on what we're trying to achieve today, okay? So, in, uh, in order to create a simple enough scenario that we can use it for a training tool, we left some things off that you might expect to see in other actual scenarios that are coming up. In fact, you have advised us to do some other things that you're not going to see in this. And we took your advice seriously, but this, you know, you're going to crawl before you walk, walk before you run. So, what you see is only changes at the K through 8 level. There are no high school changes shown on this map, even for illustration purposes. And we kept ourselves within the existing high school feeder pattern. So we held a constraint that we couldn't move any students into a different high school feeder pattern with this change, or with this uh, scenario. We made no grade reconfigurations. You're really just looking at boundary changes and what boundary changes accomplish. Um, we did not move any district-wide programs. That includes the special ed focused classrooms. So it, assume everything else that's happening in the district is intact. And we also, um, we could have done many, many more um, sequential boundary moves, domino approach. We could have moved a whole lot more kids we thought we moved enough to get the point across of what it would look, what it's gonna look like in the field. Um, we also wanna make sure that we explain what the impact of a scenario would be. So, Richard Martin, can I scroll down? Yes, I can, I have the skills. Don't I? I have one, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so in the center here, this is, um, and this gets uh, to the point that was raised earlier about humanizing what some of these impacts are. We are committed to offering a, a statement at the front of what we think this accomplishes. Now, it's up to interpretation whether we actually meet this or whether it does something else. But just to ground people in what we think this is. 
So in this case, we've written that this sample scenario does not relieve overutilization or under-enrollment at a significant number of schools. We have heard you say, through your document and through your, your meetings, right-sizing schools is a high priority for this district. I am sorry to say that our first attempt has not accomplished that. And it's partly because there's a limit to what you can do in the constraints that we set. I also want to point out that we're um, practicing with you here tonight a racial <coughs> equity impact statement where we have used the data that we observed, right, that we just were observing, and we've um, made a statement about it, and we're putting that up front. Okay, so in this case, um, right now there are 31% of our students in historically underserved racial groups are attending schools at the K level with fewer than two sections per grade level. And if we made this set of changes that we're gonna look at, that number would go down to 28%. That is an insignificant change. And since we know under enrollment <laughs> is one of our, is, is an equity issue because it means kids will have, may struggle to have access to or programs, we think this is an insufficient study. Um, it does help with over enrollment, right? So we accomplished some improvements with, with our over enrolled schools, but this is a concern that we want to put front and center. Below that, here is uh, some of those indicators that there's a lot of details about that we've rolled up to whether it's limited impact in this study, decrease, or um, in some cases it could be an increase. We don't see any of those in this particular, um, in this particular, yes please, model. Okay. Um, to the, I think that's probably the whole page, right? So over here on uh, the right side, we've described a, just a quick view of what changes in this scenario. So that when you go to the map, you'll see this list again. But essentially, this is, this is what we did. We use boundary changes within existing high school feeder patterns to try and address places where under-enrollment and over-enrollment existed. And we were somewhat successful, but we weren't as successful as we'd like to be. So now, I'm gonna turn to the map, if I can. Um, and that's in the middle, and um, We have our disclaimer at the top, we have our title, and we have our disclaimer, just in case anyone finds this document anytime over the next three weeks and takes it seriously, we wouldn't want that to happen because it's not our intent. We will have documents in a few weeks that we do hope people will take seriously, but not this time. Starting at the top here, so you also have a key down at the, um, I'm going to take you down to the bottom of the map. So here's your, your um, legend that shows you the type of school. So we've noted school locations, existing elementary, middle, and high school boundary lines, schools that are, even with this scenario, at the end of this scenario, are overutilized, which we define, and you can read that on the back, as over 105% utilization and under-enrolled, which we define as less, on average, less than two sections per grade level. Um, then in this section, these, this tells you what these different colored segments are. The different colored segments are different kinds of changes. So a change that's only at the K-5 level is this kind of slate blue. A change that's only at the 6-8 level is this mustard yellow. And a change that is at both K-5 and 6-8 is sort of the khaki green, okay? So we're kind of using a fall scheme here. <coughs> Again, the table repeated. And in this repetition, nice table, um, we're expressing both what the gray configuration is now. If this were, um, 
if there were grade reconfiguration showing, there would be a column here that would describe that. And then a little bit of an explanation. So for example, we'll pull up, Ains we'll pull up a boundary change that's into Ainsworth from Chapman. And from Chapman to Ainsworth. So can you all find that on the map? Take a minute, see if you can find that. So this is the Chapman neighborhood boundary as it exists now. Oh, it would include this little area here. So this is what the boundary is at the end of, the, um, of this scenario. And this area that's shaded is an area that used to belong to Chapman, but now would be assigned to Ainsworth. So that's how to read the changes. I want to take a moment to explain to you some of the complexities that it takes to build a scenario. Um, and I want to do that by focusing, I think, on this area of changes in here. I also want to mention that one thing that we're working toward is with each scenario having some blow up maps of regions of change so that you can get a little bit closer. To, um, to some area, so, so if you have, say, um, like, so I'll just say, I like having pointy, pointy problems. So the other thing that's happening is that this is hurting my wrist. So I'm gonna go point with my hand if you don't mind. Okay, so I would probably want to blow up this area right here so people could see a little more clearly what's subject to change. And we can do that with a smaller map that would also be included in the package. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about Creston, which is one of our under-enrolled schools. And um, Creston actually is still under-enrolled at the end of this, but we tried to see if we, can solve, if we could solve that problem. We also tried to solve an over-enrollment problem here. So I believe that in your, you have a current state map in your packet um, that you can reference later if you want. Go ahead, Matthew. Um, So the question was, are these dots for over, these are the under-enrolled, and then red is over-enrolled. Are they pre or post scenario? They are post scenario. Post scenario okay. So the idea is to show you the work that's still to be done, just on the over and under utilization categories um, at the end of this scenario. You can, what we do in our metrics is compare it to our current state to see if we made any improvements. So Preston is an under-enrolled school now, and Sunnyside is an over-enrolled school. So what we did with this change is moved a small area from Sunnyside to the next closest school, which was Glencoe. But then we moved an area from Glencoe into Preston. Those changes also had an impact on Mount Tabor, which gained students because Sunnyside is a K-8 and Glencoe is a K-5, and lost students because Glencoe is a K-5 and Preston is a K-8. So even within this little area, um, a complicated set of changes, a lot of schools involved, it's still within a high school feeder pattern. It probably doesn't really change. It probably has very little um, impact on proximity. But this is a, a, an area where there's a lot of schools in a small region. But even with that, we were unable to accomplish the goal of having, our, and our metric is at least 50 students per grade level. So if that helps with our the, tar the size that we're talking about, it's at least 50 students per grade level. And I think we wound up at like 46. The other problem that we have is Preston is a really tiny school. And if we made it any bigger than that, it would actually flip into being over enrolled. So we stopped where we could because going any further moved it into yet another category. One more place that I want to mention um, is a Kelly Elementary, an, um, an overcrowded school that I don't believe showed up as overcrowded on your first map because we, I'm not sure that we fixed the issue of having their full annex, which is for Head Start, counting as capacity. But trust me, Kelly is a very overcrowded school with a Russian immersion program and a very large Head Start program located along with this neighborhood population. In order to help Kelly, we made a change to Lint, which is a nearby K-8 school. When that happened, 
a small number of students were no longer assigned to Lane. And when that happened, Lane became an under-enrolled middle school because now Lane is less than 450 students. So in helping to solve one problem, we created another. Um, although it's not showing up as under-enrolled, but, or maybe we, maybe we found five more kids. But, um, but those are the kinds of trade-offs that happen when the only tool that you can leverage is boundary change. We couldn't conceive of shifting any of those other programs. And we couldn't look at Whitman, which is a very small K-5 right now, a K-5 that we would want to see more kids enrolled in. Um, but we couldn't do that because Whitman feeds Cleveland High School and Kelly feeds Franklin High School. So we couldn't look at making that change because we kept ourselves constricted for this map. Um, any questions? So I'm gonna pause for clarifying questions about the map. And then let me just quickly say on the back is the page that you saw before which is the KPIs for this global study. Um, yes? Could you talk about Bridger, which has two circles, so people? Oh, I'd be happy to talk about Bridger. Um, so Bridger is a school that is both under-enrolled because it has, on average, less than two sections per grade level in its neighborhood program. It also houses a two-section per grade level Spanish immersion program. And as that Spanish immersion program grows up, the building has already become overcrowded. So it's two sections per grade level at two grades, and then at, uh, I think, six, seven grades, it's only one section per grade level. So immersion is growing up. I think we know about that up at Roseway Heights as well. Immersion growing up. Cesar Chavez is the same in the north part. When immersion grows up, the neighborhood program gets trimmed down and doesn't meet our neighborhood standard. And the only way for the neighborhood program to get bigger is to overcrowd the building. So we actually, this scenario, the computer generated advice to us to move some kids out of Bridger, to make the neighborhood program even smaller, to make it just a single section program all the way through by moving some kids into Marysville. It didn't quite get Marysville even where we wanted them to be. They're at about 46 students per grade level. We couldn't even get Marysville, so we, we didn't solve those problems and we didn't solve that problem, but the computer advised us to move these kids and we could have spent time like trying to smooth that out, but we also thought we'd just bring it to you to let you see some of the complexities that go underneath it. Remember, training purposes, sample only. Um, other questions about the map? Matthew. What, uh, I'm assuming this is, oh. Thank you. I'm assuming this is current enrollment levels. Yes. And, and if so, how would forecasting be integrated into this exercise? Thank you for mentioning that. It was on one of my slides, but since I went right to the map, I didn't get there. Um, this is uh, current enrollment only. You will see in the KPIs indicator space for the impact at a five years out. I don't think those are not populated at this time. So you don't, yeah. But there will be space for us to say what it would be. So there's a couple of things about that. The first thing, and this is really important. When we show the impact on number of students, we are imagining if every student moved to understand what the maximum impact of the change could be, both now and in five years with forecast growth. The real impact is going to be dependent on the implementation plan. Right now, board policy says change starts, at least for boundary change, with new incoming students only. So the way we show impact um, for this planning document at this early stage and what we could actually expect for implementation will be different. We'll get closer to that precision if we land on changes that we really think should go to the superintendent for serious consideration. So just one more follow-up and then I'll let other people ask questions. Um, for the over-utilization and under-enrolled indicators, how would those, how would you, what's the plan to illustrate those over time on a school-by-school -school basis? That is an excellent question. We would love your advice on that because <laughs> <laughs> we 
we punted on that one today. Because, um, so we have some options. We could say, um, it only matters what happens in five years and not next year because we're going to phase in anyway. Or we could say, if ever, in the five year period and use those as, or we could say what happens, what we think would happen immediately is what matters most. So there's different ways we can handle that. We could, you know, show both, but of course, that just adds to the complexity. Um, I want to point out that um, staff has developed on the school by school sheets that are available more detailed things that you'll see by school that will help answer some of the specific questions, even if they don't show up as the global KPI. Have I? Um, Let's go to Tony and really smart people who help develop these. If I've missed anything or need to put anything else out, please, please feel free. Judy, you mentioned a lot of school-based type impacts. Where, like looking at this document, is there another document that will give us a better idea on the impact of this scenario on a school-by-school -school description? Um, it's, as Sarah mentioned earlier, we will have, um, ac everyone will have access to individual sheets that show the impact at each school. What we're thinking right now is that there would be you know, one sheet for each school, so I'll just point to Woodstock, and say that there would be a Woodstock sheet. And when you open the Woodstock sheet, it would show you all the different ways that we could change Woodstock and what the impacts of those things are in comparison to each other in the current state. So um, instead of creating new, you know, separate maps for Woodstock each and every time, but we're still, I mean, we have the capability, like staff has come up with some really great um, um, drafts for that already. We just didn't include any in your packet today to make sure that we were at least hitting the, we wanted to make sure we were hitting the global spots right. Um, but you're right, Tony, there's a lot, and I believe that at a, at a community level, if I was a parent, I would want to be able to understand the big picture, but see what it really meant for uh, my school, my neighborhood, my neighbors, et cetera. And you probably said this as well, but when I look at um, our KPIs and the master sheet, breaking them down by global. And then I try to compare them to this sheet. I'm trying to track and I'm not sure, are all of the global KPIs listed here? It seems like there might be a little bit of language difference or I'm just not matching them up. So they're all on the back, is right, sir? So can I? I no. Can I, do you want to describe? Uh, or, or maybe the better question is, what was the logic on the ones that made the front cover, I guess? That made the front cover. Right. The, um, so, Sarah, do you want to... I'm going to try and pull it up. And you, you. There's one... I, um, let me know which one's missing. But one difference is, in order to disaggregate the data, so this was one of the challenges with the KPIs, is a lot of our metrics were about numbers of schools that where something happened to them or whatever. And then we also needed to disaggregate the data by race. So we had a slight, on the back, you'll see a slight shift in language where you have, num like for example, if you look at sufficient enrollment to support core program, if you look at the back here, you'll see number of schools operating with less than two sections per grade level. So that one you saw previously. And then in order to disaggregate that, we had to, get a, we had to shift units to the student. And we said percent of students who attend schools with less than two sections per grade. So that's one slight difference between those two documents, just so that we could, we could do that disaggregation. Michael. So first off, I applaud the staff members who put all this together. Wow, what a lot of work. I do have a few suggestions. The first one is on the front page where we're showing these uh, scenarios compared to key performance indicators. And I think it's confusing where a reduction is good in some cases and an increase is good in other cases. And so I would suggest if you said something like, instead of saying number of school buildings over capacity, our, our target is to reduce the number of school buildings over capacity. And if you made the statements that way, then you could always have a check mark is good, you know, an up is good and a down is bad or something so it's consistent. Otherwise, I think we'll, we'll have a lot of confusion. So just a little suggestion there. 
we, got, we have the, the terms overutilized schools and under-enrolled schools, which, but when, when you discussed it, you said, well, this one's over-enrolled, that one's under-enrolled. But right, so we're talking about different things, so I think we need to be really clear about what that means, and we might, rather than saying under-enrolled, we might say schools with less than the target population to uh, give the uh, robust core program or whatever our, our, our terminology was there. Uh, another just little one is when you have these changes from current K-5 boundary, you might say that, you know, it's something that explains that when it's colored in, it's colored into the new boundary as opposed to the old boundary. Because when you look at the map, you can't really tell if that has been added to Ainsworth or taken from, you know, or added to Chapman. So those are just really small ones just to make it a little more readable. Uh, he had the shading issue. Yeah, I think the other thing is just um, when in the um, in your key, just illuminating that things, certain things are future state or existing state. I mean, I think they're all future, but I spent some time thinking, oh, is, are you talking about the future, the future state in, on the boundary lines, and the shading, or the you know existing state? So just clarifying that point, and I concur with Michael that to the extent that you can use red, yellow, greens, or Ups are good, um, some kind of value-based thing, because on the front, um, it's confusing when down is good and uh, down is a positive is, an, is a confusing concept for brains. You know, I, um, I, I don't have a, a specifics tonight, but I want to give a little thought to it. And just my experience with these things is that it's really useful to have some version of it, especially when we're comparing scenarios, that you can just scan and kind of get the big picture of what's going on. And uh, then you have the ability to drill down across the whole system and sort of see, like even on the key indicators, what's going up, what's going down. I think it's what you've heard a, a theme of. I don't know what that looks like, but we always, it's good to design uh, data so that, you, you, like this one, you've given a name. This is limited changes. What's limited changes look like? And it's this, you know, it's just easier to scan. I don't know what the solution is. Um, one thing that, you know, we always try to do is get people oriented to the thing they're going to look at before it changes, so you're sort of clued into that's the geography and then you can track the changes more easily, which is kind of what you've done. So there's something I don't quite, I have to think about it, like I say, but I think your symbology is probably too small. Uh, it's, you know, we need to bump it up so it's just bigger blocks of color because it really doesn't tell us that much detail anyway. It's simpler to read, uh, consistent throughout, and that we have a table at some point that allows us to see in a way that we see for every scenario more of the detail. But you know, not exhaustive detail, but scanning the information is what my initial impulse is. I'm not really sure what the solution is. So, uh, Maxine. Looking at the key performance indicators, and I'm looking, I guess perhaps because I'm a little, I'm a lot disappointed um, about the uh, diversity uh, aspects of this. But I'm looking at um, the one above, uh, it says, uh, the second one from the bottom in terms of sufficient enrollment to support core programs. And then under it, we've got schools not overcrowded. And I would suggest that that language, that capture, should be insufficient enrollment to support core programs. Changing the language kind of diminishes what schools not overcrowded really entail. I think it would be better defined if it were defined in the same manner that sufficient enrollment is either sufficient or insufficient. And here it just says not overcrowded. Um, and I think that that just does a disservice for what we are hoping to. So uh, we're a few minutes over on this agenda item. Um, Sheila? Was 
actually similar to Michael's question. Um, I wasn't really sure if there was a difference between overcrowded and overcapacity or if those things just mean the same thing. Overcrowded it is. So are we ready to transition to Margaret? Sorry, I've been, we had leadership today, so I've been sitting for a while, I had to stand up. So um, one of the things that, uh, what's that? Since 7.30. We, yes, anyway. Um, so part of the, the limit, limit student disruption piece um, so I just want to make sure I want to check my understanding on what this, this last part under the key performance indicators is saying. Um, this says that 933 students are impacted. This says that of those 933, 316 or about a third of them are um, historically underserved by race. Um, and that a little more than a third of them are students in poverty. So what would be helpful, and I don't know how we do this or how this plays out. So the, the, the statement says limit student disruption. Um, so historically underserved by race, if it's a third of the students moved, is definitely not a third of our students are students of color, right, in the district. So the proportion of students being impacted that are historically underserved by race compared to their overall population. So if there's 30% or 29% are in poverty, so it is about a third. For poverty. For poverty. Yeah. Right? And, and, and well, race, yeah, but this is just for historic, these are for racial groups. So your point is you want to be able to compare not just the number, but Correct. how that... Um, as a proportion the, of the, 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 the overall yeah. po population as it is. Because part of what we're describing, I believe I heard us say earlier, is that we're looking to be aware of the impact on historically underserved populations in a little, with a little more clarity. Yep, that's great. Thanks. I just want to... Uh, Dr. Adair. This, this is going to be an interesting dynamic when you decide whether that's a good or a bad or an uneven when it comes to the racial breakout. Because um, I don't know that you need to put it on the chart, but I want to encourage that just in case the question gets asked, that there's, there's always the access to how many African Americans are you talking about? How many black students are you talking about? How many Pacific Islanders? Because when you lump them together, you don't have an ability to, uh, to um, pull out the trends which may end up in unintended consequences of an isolated population of African Americans. Now, from my perspective, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But from somebody else's perspective, that may be a bad thing. And in somebody else's perspective, I mean, a good thing. And from somebody else's perspective, it may be a neutral thing. And that's where this conversation that has to go somewhat deeper needs more granular information because it definitely is. Um, and given our track record of an over-identification of black males in special education, that focus option class being disaggregated by race has to be something that also has to occur. Because you may end up, and then you throw in the poverty disaggregation, you may end up with one's population being more negatively or positively impacted by these kinds of changes. And you just need to have that information accessible, not necessarily on the chart, but it definitely has to be at the forefront. I think that's what my colleague was saying across the way. Okay, so I would like to um, pick up my mic because that's what I'm supposed to do. Sorry. And uh, let me just, just recap. Um, the scenario is for training purposes only. Thank you for um, giving us really important feedback. Um, 
what we tried to, we limited ourselves in many ways here. You should expect something different in the future. Um, these were additional constraints that I didn't mention before, but that we held to. We kept boundaries contiguous. Um, we said that K-5s can only feed into one middle school, so we didn't split elementaries into more than one middle school in this. And um, we didn't have K-5 schools feed into K-8 schools for, this, for, six, eight, for grade 6-8. Um, as mentioned, we use current students and not projections in this scenario only. To find contiguous um, things that, that touch each other. So the boundaries were all sets that, that touched each other. We didn't pick up pieces that weren't touching and create boundaries with them. Um, within these constraints, we attempted to decrease the number of schools that have less than two sections per grade level, decrease the number of schools that were operating above 105% or overcrowded, and limit the number of students who were impacted by boundary change. You can see that we did not um, accomplish our goals very effectively. Um, and um, half, of, but half of our currently overutilized schools do not see improvements in this scenario, for example. Um, this was, again, the, um, the racialized impact. So a racial impact statement of what's accomplished in this particular scenario. And I'm saying this now not so that um, I can either justify or tear down the scenario, but to help you just get a sense of what to expect when we do this again, um, when, you know, um, when it's not a drill in a few weeks. Okay. Um, I really appreciate your attention on that. Um, I'm going to just move right into the next topic. Right? Uh, I want to go to Jason for a quick minute on a potential agenda item change. One quick addition, which was Jim had informed me during our conversations that there were folks who had signed up for public comment but didn't have the chance to do so. Um, so um, I wanted to make a request of the members that are with our operating procedures that we do have the ability to extend the meeting. So I wanted to throw a motion out there, which was that we would extend the meeting for an additional 10 minutes to allow those who didn't get a chance to offer public comment. And Jim knows who those folks are. Um, so that would put our end official end time no later than around 8.25 and 8.30 at the absolute latest. Um, and given that we end, our normal end time is at 8.15, so I just wanted to check with members if that was okay. Um, so I, So I need an official two-thirds, which is 10 or 11, so I need to, for all those that are okay with it, green cards up, please. One, two, three, four, Jim, do the count. Uh, motion carried. Uh, we'll extend the meeting to 8:25, and we'll take uh, public comment from the people who uh, had signed up but were not able to testify earlier. Uh, no, so that will be at the so, end. So, um, so we will um, do our best. So we have two more agenda items to move through. Um, I think this one is um, really an information item. Uh, we apologize. Um, our colleague John Isaacs is quite ill and so not able to be here. This is something that he wanted to make sure. Um, that we shared with the um, committee. And um, do you, um, so there's sort of two phases for this. So Aaron, I'm just gonna run through it and then will you answer questions if, if needed? Um, so what you see above here, and you're probably familiar by now, the schedule. Um, one question you may be asking is if, since we shifted this date, does it affect these things? Um, GOM staff has worked very hard to fill in all of this so that it will be a full and robust, robust month in November um, for community engagement around the scenarios. And there's a schedule that will be coming out next week of what those meetings will be. So people will not have to wait until the 29th to find when the meetings start. Um, and then we think that we're still in a time frame for this and emphasizing that um, we expect some phasing of implementation, and so um, something still might land in fall 2016. We'll know more, obviously, by here of what that is. Uh, any questions about this big timeline? And then I want to drill down to your timeline and what you can expect in your coming meetings for a moment. But anything on the big timeline right now, and anything on this? Can I get a question of clarification about? Um, 
Sorry, question of clarification about implementation may occur in stages. So what, um, what you're planning to roll out on October 29th is, a, is stage one or a comprehensive view which may then be stage. Does that make sense? To the degree that we can um, express an idea for implementation, you will see that in the first level of scenarios that come out here. We fully expect that the work that you do and the input from the community will cause revisions in scenarios. It will cause us to focus a little further in some places. So the detailed implementation frame is likely to be what the superintendent proposes or what we, when, we're, when we're narrowing, that's when more information about implementation would happen. But let me give an example. If we had a school, for example, that we decided to, we needed to bring back online, we may not be able to do that by 2016. And so would have an implementation timeline that would move um, it, into later years. Those are the kinds of things that if it's, if it's known and clear, we would try and establish here. Other than that, it'll get finer as we get closer in here. People will definitely want to know that information in some detail before they can advise the superintendent and board how to proceed. Thank you. Any other questions on this? Erin, did we miss anything? Like so just a quick thing. So I'm Erin Barnett, and I'm um, in the communications office. Uh, John is out sick. And I, just super briefly, I do want to emphasize that as we are all experiencing this as staff, as committee members, many of us are also parents. My son's a fifth grader at Rigi. Um, most of us have kids across the cities who are also experiencing this as parents. And it's awesome to see the service of our committee members and also so many interested people in the audience. And I guess what I'm hoping is as you look at this and as you see what happened tonight, that you're understanding the incredible thought and care that's going into this and that the reason that we're doing this has to do, as our committee I think has stated, we recognize that we have some imbalances that are creating challenges for all of our kids in different ways across our city. We're extremely lucky that we're growing and therefore we can make some of these changes without closing schools. We have had to do this when we had to close schools. It was really hard. Now we're in this, a really exciting period of growth and we're trying to use that as a time to make some changes that help all of our kids and that's being done very, very thoughtfully and with a lot of opportunity for input. In November when we do the community meetings, um, we're going to have um, at this count eight um, all over the city, uh, also Twitter, Facebook, town halls, you can always comment by email, we will do an online survey, and you better believe all of these folks here are going to be listening really carefully. They live in our neighborhoods, they are parents like us and community members like all of us. So that's what's coming up. We're excited to make those good and helpful meetings for everybody to give their Aaron, feedback. Erin, would you mention the partners who are on board to help yes, us with those meetings? Yes, thank you for queuing me. Thank you, Judy. Um, so yes, we are not doing these meetings alone. We are partnering with a range of community groups, including the PTA, um, a number of groups that won't come off the top of my head, um, Apano, uh, Black Parent Initiative, and others who are stepping up, and, and the Center for Intercultural Organizing, who are stepping up, who have experience also in this type of engagement, and are coming together as groups to offer um, very special, I believe, community engagement opportunities across the city. So they're handled right. It is, it is PPS supporting, and it is very much in partnership because we all realize this is something that affects our whole city, and we want to do it well, and we want to do it right. So thank you. Yeah. So, um, so what about you? <laughs> um, I wanted to just put up a couple pointers right now. Um, to get you thinking about your coming meetings and um, do a reality check too. If, if, do these things seem like good ideas we should be planning for at this time? Um, this is what's coming up next. We expect that it'll be a lot of staff description and a lot of what you just did tonight. Clarification. We do not anticipate that you will be prepared to give substantive feedback on things that you've just seen. Please don't think that we expect that. However, if you see errors, if you see any showstoppers, and, and you can tell us at the time, please do so, because we will still have an opportunity to make revisions before things go out to the public. You'll come back a week later, November 5th. That's for more clarification. If anything was wrong, we'll tell you what we changed. Um, and discussion, beginning that assessment discussion. What do you need to do a good job assessing this? How do you need to work together to get that done. 
Um, in talking with Hector and the equity department, we're prepared to come back with you then on a meeting that's really focused on a racial equity lens. I probably shouldn't have put training, Hector, but just an orientation and a chance then to exercise to use that tool on the scenarios, okay? You're also probably gonna wanna be at each of these meetings debriefing what you're hearing if you're visiting those listening sessions. Moving into December, yes, December. Continuing scenario assessment, but getting close to that time when you need to deliver something to the superintendent. Everything in italics is not on your calendar yet, but we're putting it out there now um, just in case you haven't experienced enough discomfort tonight. This is a Saturday. An idea has come up of maybe having a Saturday work session to give you time to go as deep as you need to go. If we were to do that, this would be the date. Holding December 10th. Ideally, you're concluding your assessment around this time, and then maybe even December 17th, which is sort of like a final point. If we don't have it, if you can't do it then, or if you can't do all of it by then, then we would certainly need to let the superintendent know because it may affect the rest of the timeline. Um, anybody have any substantial feedback, just top of the mind right now, of this? part of, of the news. Uh, I just want to interject one thing. Remember, you don't have to give perfect advice to the superintendent. You give as good as advice as you can possibly do based on what you've learned and what you've thought about. So give yourselves a break on perfection. Comments, red flags, serious objections, on board. What do you think, Sheila? to go back to the, I just want to make sure I have everything correctly on my calendar. So um, if you could go back one slide. Um, well, there's no meeting on the, there's no meeting on the 12th, 5th to 19th. Okay, thank you. But then go we back. We think we can keep you busy those weeks. And then go back to the um, potential. So I can get those on. We will um, get these loaded. We will send you appointments for all of these. Um, I'm sure there'll be further discussion about uh, a, a Saturday session and the like, but, um, but we wanted to, to yes, Dr. Dick. So I just kind of, I know I'm the oldest one in the group, but I'm just wondering, <laughs> technologically, can't we do something all, via the technology out here? Thank you. Can't you do, no, I know it couldn't have come from me because us old people don't know anything about any of that stuff, but. Like Saturday, couldn't that be a webinar or something instead of me coming sure. into the ad building? Sure. I'd kind of like to see that up on the, on the chart. We can, we can pursue doing that, um, uh, being able to participate remotely. You I just don't get to see each other's faces as well, that's all. I'm a lot nicer when I can sit at my kitchen table with my bunny slippers on than I am when I have to get dressed on Saturday. <laughs> that may be worth a try then. So can I, uh, just in the interest of time, get a quick uh, card show from the group. Green, you can live with this. Uh, yellow, um, you can't live with it. And red, you hate it. All right, I'm seeing lots of green people can live with it. OK, so let's move to uh, the home stretch here. Um, and I'll turn it to Jason here in just a second, uh, but the soft neighborhood model, uh, and that had a fair amount of activity earlier in the week, and I thought I saw Brooke here earlier this evening, but uh, there she is. There, Jason, you've got a mic. So, um, committee members, just to let you know, um, I just wanted to give you all an update on, on kind of some of the board action that has happened. What, this past week, which is kind of the explanation for why we're having this particular agenda item tonight. Um, so kind of the parts to this discussion are going to give you, staff and I are going to give you an overview of what the soft neighborhood model concept is. And um, really quick, I just wanted to thank Brooke Cowan, who spent months, I think, with some colleagues to develop the model, present it to DRAC. She shared it with staff. And then she shared again her full, I think, 40 plus page assessment of that model to us, where staff have also kind of made a determination of how that could potentially impact our timeline. So, Brooke, I just wanted to thank you for working with us to kind of get that presentation developed within the last 24 hours. So thank you very much for helping out. Um, 
So after we talk through the soft boundary model, I'm going to give you a recap of the board action this past week. We'll do an overview of what the model is, and in particular, um, Sarah and Judy met this past week to kind of figure out, based on the model and the complexities, how, what is the capacity of staff to potentially implement that model, given the timeline that we've got, uh, got with us now. And then after that, I'm gonna, what we're going to do is going to have a bit of a group discussion on, based on the presentation that you've heard tonight for the committee, like what we need to do in terms of a next step for that. I didn't do anything, I was over here. 8 p.m. shut down, give us, keep talking. Keep talking. <laughs> okay. It's, it's efficiency, that's energy, energy conservation. Energy conservation, okay. Thank you. Well, I, well I'm just gonna make sure, because I think everyone in the committee has hard copies, and I think as folks walked in, there were hard copies given at the front table, so did, did everyone potentially get copies of this as you walked in, don't know? Okay. So, Okay, so if you go to page three of the slide, which is titled Deep Requisition Stated in the Framework. So our original board adopted framework, which we adopted by 20 to do, which was adopted by Carol was, and was endorsed by the board. Um, so these were some key components to the framework where we specifically addressed the concept of the soft neighborhood model. Um, so the model should be evaluated after PPS has developed plans for offering a baseline level of academic program offerings at all schools as well as a great configuration. The model's success could also be achieved if PPS were able to ensure a baseline of equitable academic program offerings at every school, which could help them reduce a creating a winners versus losers environment in a choice system. So what our framework that we submitted to the superintendent, which was endorsed by the board, said that this model is worth consideration and study, but after a number of components of the system needed to be addressed and remedied by the district. That, that included everything from program offerings across all schools, balanced enrollment, but in particular, one of the things we also had to consider was grade configuration. So that this model could be considered after some key things were taken. So again, this, this position was adopted by the committee 20 to two. So then if you flip to page four, so I'll just I'll quickly summarize what the board action was this past week. So to clarify, the board formally endorsed our framework by a vote of six to one Monday night. But there was an important question that was raised by a couple of board members, and so that is why we're having the discussion tonight, specifically around how can this particular model potentially be incorporated or generate a scenario and assessed by this committee as part of the timeline that we're currently on as set forth by the past board resolution in our timeline. So the discussion that we're gonna have tonight is to get an overview directly of what this model does, how staff believes the current, the proposal impacts our current timeline, and then what I'll do shortly after the presentation is frame up the group discussion and the two different options for voting, which for the members I sent you all an email last night. So um, with that, I am going to turn it over to Judy and or Sarah. Okay, so uh, we just want to quickly um, provide a brief overview of the model document that's available online, point out some of the differences, which is our assessment between the model and current PPS policy and practice, and an initial estimate of the resources needed to create an enrollment balancing scenario using that model. So um, we, uh, Sarah and I were fortunate that uh, Brooke Cowan has been very available to us, and um, she's actually here tonight too, but um, we did talk with her today and walk through this part of the presentation. She gave us some good edits. So, the soft neighborhood model is an assignment system for students at their point of entry. So whenever you enter the system, this would be used to determine which school you attend. Most entry is at kindergarten, but it can work for other grades. Once a student is assigned to a school, they get to remain there at that school through the highest grade, so you don't get a new assignment every year. You, get, you stay assigned to that school. It also allows students to remain with their cohort through the middle and high school feeder pattern or to apply for reassignment at sixth or ninth grade. So that's how it handles assignment overall. And there's way more to it than this. I've just given you the bare bones picture. 
The model uses proximity, how close a student lives to a school, the capacity of schools, and sibling status to determine which school a student will have the right to attend. Students have the best chance of being assigned to their closest school so long as enrollment can be balanced across all the schools in the student's region. And parent choice is not a factor in the soft neighborhood model, but that doesn't impact that parents have other choices in the system. When it comes to your neighborhood school, parents don't get a say in what that neighborhood assignment would be <coughs> in the soft neighborhood model. So there's an example, and um, all of this is in the document that you have access to online if you would like to see more. So here's a child who lives at 22nd and Mason and they've calculated the, the, as the crow flies distances to different schools. So any of these schools could be the school of assignment for a student living at this address, um, Sabin being the closest school, but the actual um, probability of being assigned to Sabin has also to do with the um, capacity here and how many students are nearby the other schools, okay? Um, pointing out also that um, these schools are outside of what we would currently consider our high school theater patterns. So a student could go in this direction, that direction, that direction. There could be implications at the middle and high school level as well. Um, what is diversity in the soft neighborhood model? It means, for the purpose of this model, the measure of how many schools are represented within a thousand feet of each student's home. So essentially, how many kids from different areas are represented in a school. It's not a measure of student demographics. And that's partly because um, the, the, the paper that you have access to is largely a proof of concept, and the data set that was available from Portland Public Schools did not include disaggregated data. There's a lot of protection around attaching um, status such as race free and reduced meals um, to where a student lives, exactly where a student lives. Even if you take their name out, the fact that you say where they live means you can identify them. So th there was a limit to what they could do in this model. Okay, so quickly, how does this compare to how we do things in PPS now? Well, we have a policy right now that, that says all students in grades K through 12 are assigned to a neighborhood school based on the address where they live with their parent or if they're emancipated. So address equals name of school at every grade level. In the soft neighborhood model, a student's home address increases probability of being assigned to a closer school, but it does not guarantee any specific school. So clearly, moving to this model requires a change to this policy. Additionally, um, in our current action, you, you have that right at any time of year and at any grade level. Now, it is the intent of the um, soft neighborhood model designers to provide for mid-year assignments for the kids who move in in January. However, they weren't able to do that because of insufficient data. So there isn't a lot of information in the model of how that works. It could work but it isn't described clearly in the model, okay? So what happens to kids who don't know nine months in advance that they're going to kindergarten, for example? Um, we have a racial educational equity policy in PPS, which states that Portland Public Schools will significantly change its practices in order to achieve and maintain racial equity in education. So we would ask, what is the racialized impact of going to a system like this? Again, the model team was not able to t test the racial impact of this model due to insufficient data. So if, there, if, it, if it's perceived as better or worse or what the impact is, is not known at this time. Finally, um, as a comparison, current PPS policy, which is consistent with Oregon state law, provides that we transport elementary school kids who live within outside of a mile of their home to their neighborhood school or middle school students who live outside of 1.5 miles to their neighborhood school. Um, transportation costs in this model may increase um, because students from the same block may wind up being transported to different schools. So in the um, picture that we showed, it's likely that there would be virtually no impact. Just regard, I mean, because there's, this is such a dense area for schools, um, that child would, would walk to every one of those schools. However, in other parts of the district, 
where schools are further away, you could have kids from, from the same area and bus service would have to be provided from the same block to different schools. Okay, so that is a very quick, very high level overview and then Sarah's just gonna briefly talk about what staff has been able to come up with as potential impacts. Go for it. Okay, so um, I was asked to talk a little bit about the timeline. So what I would say and how this, how this scenario might impact our current timeline. Um, so what I would say is, um, the soft neighborhood model is what I would call a paradigm shift. So it's not, um, and it's a, sh a paradigm shift for the entire PPS system. So um, what I would say is that it would require significant changes to both our um, existing technical and operational infrastructure, both in the short and long term. So um, I'll talk about the long term just for a minute. Um, the long term, I, we might have to rethink and redefine sort of how we would do transportation. Um, we might have to rethink how we do staffing of schools um, and our enrollment and transfer systems. We would need to rethink about that. So um, that's all to say that this is, um, while some of those systems would need to change with boundary enrollment balancing anyway, I think this would almost completely, um, it would transform them potentially. And so what I would say in the long term is we would need to th think through some of those, those impacts. But in the, I want to also talk about the short term, like do you just want to see a sample of it? Um, so what we would need to do from the short term from a technical standpoint is program some sort of new algorithm. We would need to be able to test it. Um, we would need to then be able to analyze it um, for its different impacts. So she said uh, throughout the, the presentation that she just gave, like we haven't, you know, we haven't tested the racial impacts and all that kind of stuff. Um, no fault to um, Brooke and her um, great work. It's, it's about the data that was provided to her. Um, and so we would need to do all of that stuff. So what it, I think it's, it's and, then on, and then we would need to think about how we actually, back to the packaging and reporting, we spent a lot of time just thinking about how this information is displayed. Um, imagine creating a map with this, with this model. It, we'd have to really think about how that would look. Um, there's sort of how that would, um, how we would make it so that the general community can understand. So I think what I'm getting at is that we would, we would not make an October 29th um, deadline to be able to do any of that, um, that work. Doesn't mean we would be willing to do it, um, uh, but that's sort of what it does to the timeline. And I would say that it would push us out far enough um, that we would be looking into not making um, significant changes at all for next year. So that is um, staff's quick assessment, and Jason, um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm watching the clock and I know that we have limited time, but back to you. So it, with, to respond to the board's you know, question that they posed to me and staff uh, Monday night, so it's my job to kind of formally pose the question to the committee based on the information that you've all just gotten tonight. So we'll have a bit of a discussion to kind of see where folks are. So I just want to queue up what the options are to kind of clarify where we may be headed next. So there are two votes on the table tonight. So option A is that DBRAC reaffirms its previous position in the enrollment balancing framework. Therefore, that DBRAC is advising staff to not develop the scenario based on the soft neighborhood uh, model at this particular time. Or option B is that we as a committee would be advising staff to generate a scenario and apply the soft neighborhood model. So one of the maps that we could see down the road is applying the particular model that we've just looked at. But additionally, staff would include that scenario among those potentially submitted later this month for our assessment. So that's, that's option B. Um, and the only last thing I will say is because I did send this information out last night, there are some members who are not here tonight and they did send around their responses. So once you've all had your discussion, I'll share with you what their votes were and then the record will show what their votes and any additional comments that they provided as well. Committee member comments? Sasha. So at the end of option B, it says, staff shall include the scenario among those submitted to DBRAC for assessment at its 1029 meeting. And that's not possible? It's highly unlikely. I'm, I'm asking, right. It's highly unlikely. Okay. I just want to be clear on the timeline issue, which would then push the entire process back, meaning we would probably not be able to make significant changes for next school year. Is that what I heard? Not through this process. Right. I just want, I want to make sure everybody understood what, what I heard. Okay, thanks. 
Michelle, then Shannon. That was my same question, but now I still have it. So, um, just by looking at this option, it would prevent any change at all, or we could still look at it whenever it arrived. And it, is it going to compromise? I, I, I thought I understood the answer, but yeah. now I don't understand. It. So I guess um, what what we're saying is, in to get a good, solid, soft neighborhood model that has all of the same requirements and packaging that the other scenarios do, I feel really confident that we would not be able to do that by October 29th. Um, so that's, that's one statement. If we dropped everything and just focused on that, I can guarantee you we would not be able to then produce other scenarios that did um, you know, other things. Does that, does that help? So as um, one of the educator representatives on DBRAC, um, we spoke in our um, executive board meeting last night with the Portland Association of Teachers. So I'm actually speaking for the executive board tonight. And as teachers, we're very concerned about the soft neighborhood model because we know the overcrowding and that there is some real um, unknowns. And we're talking about teachers' jobs and students' ability to be in their buildings and teachers who are already dealing with severe overcrowding. And so I'm just saying that there's some real concerns from PAT around the soft neighborhood model because we already have enough challenges trying to come up with a hard neighborhood model. And we feel like coming up with a clear framework first, getting our kids settled, and then examining this might be a better way to look at things. Tony, then Sheila. So because this is a, a point of entry, um, I'm talking, you know, suppose it was implemented, there's a real time lag to time when it will actually have an impact on um, actual enrollment and capacity, right? Because we're not, it's not going to, everybody's already in our schools. It's only going to impact um, new students coming in, new K. It's, it's designed to, to address students when they enter the system. It is likely that we would need an intervention that rebalances first, and then we would apply that as the new way for people to enter the system after the ma a major intervention. Um, again, that their proof of concept was not uh, necessarily about you know how to immediately solve issues at all grade levels now. So it's a different way of assignment in the future. <laughs> Tony. So a year and a half ago, when first thinking about this problem, for me the focus was the map and drawing lines on the map. But we discovered through the work PSU's done for us, the surveys that have been out there input from uh, the community meetings we've done, um, it's much more than just drawing boundaries. There's great configurations, there's facilities improvements. So um, the drawing the lines is just a very small part of balancing enrollment and it seems to me like a huge undertaking for just one of the efforts. And I don't know that I would have said that same thing a year and a half ago, but based on all the work we've done and the effort into this, not to say that at some point in the future this might be something worth looking at, but now it doesn't feel right to me. Sheila. I have a couple of questions. Um, so first of all, isn't it true that there are more factors than just distance, capacity, and sibling status that could be used to determine the probability that a student would be assigned to a specific school? Um, I'm making eye contact, if possible, with Ms. Cowan. Based on our conversation today, I believe the answer for this proof of concept and model at this time is no. Those are the only factors used to determine assignment. Right, but for example, if you, um, 
if you had other information about the students um, that um, should, uh, that we would want to consider in determining how to assign a student to a school, couldn't we use that in the probability-based model? Yes. Which would, which could possibly allow us to consider some of the complexities that Tony was just talking about. Yes. Okay, and then my second question is, I, I, um, first of all, I like the idea of getting the schools right sized first and then thinking about how this might, um, how this might ease issues in the future. And so one of my questions is, how do you feel about the, um, about the relative cost of running a boundary change process like this versus the cost of changing the way we assign students so that the student, so that the schools don't get overcrowded in the first place. Uh, Alice. So I guess I had a question um, a couple of slides back when it said that the model team was not able to um, test the racial impact for this. Is that the PPS model team or? So does, I guess my next question then is, understanding the time constraints, um, does the PPS model team, I mean, is there a way, is there a way to do it in-house, I guess? So, so I think one kind of in-between solution, which wouldn't probably be satisfactory to be a true comparison with any model we produce, would be that like Brooke could pass back whatever the school assignments she made were, and then we could apply um, demographics back to, to the data, and then, or map it. And, and then we would at least kind of see some of the impact. And the reason we have to do that, just to be clear, is we're under strict rules about handing over personally identifiable information. So like there's, there's actually a process if we were to do that, and, we, and that in itself takes up some time. So I guess then my other question is, understanding that, um, if it's not our, the school's model that can be utilized ongoing, how, how will we keep it up in the future, I guess? You know, if it's a back and forth thing, or are we just? Yeah, we would just implement the software. She would give us the software we, we did implement. Well, we would, if, if for whatever reason she wasn't able to give us the software, we would figure out a way that um, replicated it to the best of our abilities. Yeah. So, which, it, if this helps, this would be just so that we could get additional information about the model now, not a means of implementing it for, you know, yeah. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is the impact of policy change and other things that would impact timeline if we were to um, seriously investigate this and take steps to implement it now. So let's, in light of the time, I'll do Matthew with the last comment and then uh, we'll do option A or option B. Um, so yeah, in light of time, I, I, I'll just be brief. Just a quick comment. Um, you know, redrawing school boundaries is obviously very challenging and emotionally charged issue and the how this process has been advertised to the community I don't believe is one that would um, naturally lend itself to moving forward with a soft neighborhood model the possibility that there could be students living next door to each other neighbors friends that are going to different schools where there's a wholesale reform to a, a transportation infrastructure in the schools. It seems to me to be, and I don't remember who said it, somebody said a, a whole paradigm shift in how Portland Public operates. That's not a, a boundary review process. That's a whole, it's, a, it's just a much larger process that would, would need a, a much larger engagement effort with the community around how we educate as a community. So I, under, I understand the ideas some of the ideas behind the soft boundary model and where it's coming from, but I don't believe that 
this process has, has is, this is not the process we're running in. So I, I'm very concerned with it. And I'll just leave, I'll leave it at that. Okay, so we're gonna wrap up this discussion and then um, with the two scenarios up on the screen, um, I'm just gonna report out from at least the three members who aren't here that um, called or emailed me with their votes and then we'll go ahead and call for official votes. So Scott Bailey uh, voted for option A, uh, Kim Wilson voted for option A, and Nisha Saxena voted for option A. Um, so with that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and call for votes. So um, all those in favor of option A, would you please raise your hand and Jim will count the votes. for option B. Any abstentions? Aye. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, so uh, we have a group of people who had signed in earlier and we were not able to um, spend the time then. So I'm gonna call the list of people, if you could come up if you're still here. Uh, and remember, anyone who is here, you can write down comments and feedback for the group and turn it into Monine back there, standing up waving her hand. So I'm um, calling Caroline Lou Wolf, and I apologize if I get anyone's name wrong. Shirley Baker, Shirley Baker, David Mosen, or maybe Mosem, uh, Paul Silo, S C I L O, Lori Lombardi, uh, says concerned student parent, okay, uh, and then Linda Melotti and Amanda Cagle. That's our list. So, and again, uh, I've got our one minute timer. Caroline. Um, first of all, thanks Jim and Jason for extending the time. It's really important for all of us parents here who've taken time out of um, our, our family time to be here. But also, thank you guys, because I realize now how much work has gone into this, and it's a lot of work, and it's for a really noble cause. Um, some of the feedback that I have, uh, just in my kind of initial uh, review uh, of the framework and the KPIs and, and listening to what you guys have said tonight and the feedback that you all have given is um, I have three things that I wanted to bring up and one is enrollment utilization metrics, two, walking distance from school, and three, adding some additional um, average, median, max to certain metrics, uh, certain KPIs, okay? The first one is around enrollment and utilization metrics. So if we think about capacity constraints helping to determine enrollment targets, um, you may have already talked about this in previous meetings. meetings. Um, these two KPIs are essentially derivatives of the same metric. Be because if we take this, the, the room capacity here is 150, and if we know that the room capacity is 150, and if we can have a college-sized classroom of 150 here, and that's okay for the college-sized classroom, you're gonna see the same direction, direction of movement of capacity constraints being met as well as, uh, as uh, utilization of, or uh, enrollment. So my question is, it's okay to measure both, but from an optic standpoint, because I'm schooled from the Nike School of Thought here, from an optic standpoint, you basically are showing the same metric twice. And it's okay to review both of them, but my thought is, how do we show it in a way that doesn't repeat? Because they're, they're gonna move in the same direction. Second thing here, is um, around walking distance from school. As parents in this room, I can tell you almost every parent in this room would like to see travel time added to that. And it could be in addition to walk distance, but in this day and age, walk distance is a really, it is a far-fetched idea for many schools. It's, sometimes it's about safety of your students walking to and from school. There is travel time. And, it's, and 
That needs to be accounted for, and I can almost take a vote here of the parents who believe strongly that travel time is important, and that is based on traffic patterns and everything. <laughs> the last point I will make on, on, and this relates to walking distance, and it may relate to some other metrics as well, is that we are looking at averages. Averages don't tell you very much. You have to look at a median also, and a max, and a min sometimes. So if we're looking at, for example, travel time, some students are gonna have a 30 second travel time, okay? Um, that would be, my, that would be my, uh, my example of where I live currently to my elementary school. Um, but some other students are gonna have a max, and we have to know what those max and mins are, because there are gonna be some students, and we need to understand what the outliers are too, because that is part of your model. When we look at averages, averages don't tell us very many things. Thank you, uh, Shirley Baker. So my original comment was like over three minutes, so I'm gonna try to really cut this down. Okay, um, we're from Skyline School. We've got quite a few parents, they've gone home, but. Um, so we're a thriving K-8 IB primary and middle years pro <clears throat> program. Uh, despite being under-enrolled, overcrowded, having geographic and building challenges. The message, we recently had a meeting, and the message our parents wanted to present, even though we know that you're not um, deciding the K-8 changes, it, we believe it plays into the process, and we love our K-8 IB program. Some of the things that happen at Sky Skyline Daily well, actually, some key points we wanted you to know about Skyline is that we're consistently just under Title I status. We're economically diverse, a certified premier green school, one of the first PPS schools to achieve the Backyard Habitat certification. Uh, daily, our students have the opportunity to participate in community service. They are very proud of their school and community and work hard to contribute to their success. Um, they have and take advantage of opportunities to mentor our younger students, which is consistent with the IV attributes, and it's so important in today's world. So we would ask a couple of things, and one is to slow down the process to make sure that there's adequate community engagement. And as far as one of your KPIs went, it was regarding walk time. And for our school, there is no walk time, it's all drive time. And so we're concerned about extensive transportation costs. And again, we love our school and thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, David Musum. Uh, David Musum. Uh, so, oh, oh, okay. Uh, concerned student parent, sorry. And, yeah. and if you can say your name, please. Hey, sure, I'm Wolf Lam and here. Uh, uh, three years ago, we moved from Hillsboro with, with a lot of daughters and sons and moved to Portland School District. We're hoping for good neighborhood schools. That's the reason we came here. Okay, and uh, today in the meeting, I heard about and uh, the, just the enrollment boundary rebalancing is a full scale citywide and it's planning to move really quickly. Okay, with this contest, I have one question. You know, has this balancing movement been uh, conducted locally, first at a uh, small scale, to see what is gonna work? Then, probably we can move to a larger scale, to city-wise, and to see, and really that's a good idea or not, okay? And if not, rushing this movement under the name of equity will be like a big social experiment. And I will have a problem to use my kids as a specimen in this experiment. How about you fail? Okay, it's a big concern for me and for the future. Okay, and the last time, when I heard about moving people and around and the, uh, uh, under the name of equity, it was in communist com uh, countries. And the, uh, I grew up in a communist country. And I know it was no good and it failed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so is it uh, Lori? I'm Amanda. I'm Amanda. Uh, Amanda, go ahead. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Hi, I'm 
Amanda Cagle, and I have, um, I have three kids in Pope, Portland Public Schools right now. I would like to address the staff, but also DBRAC on the issue of distance, because while I understand that there's distance and that it can be difficult to factor in travel time, there's a real problem with the model that you're using when it comes to kids getting from Forest Park to Roosevelt, because as the crow flies, I've heard from other people that that is a close distance. Having, there's only one road, and it is Germantown Road. I have a girlfriend who is a, a, a bus driver in Beaverton, and she was, she said buses, school buses aren't allowed to drive on Beaverton because it's, I mean, on, on, on Germantown because it's not safe. I've tried to go down Germantown last October, and we had to turn around because a tree had fallen. So I would ask that you consider in your model, not, I understand distance, but you need to consider actual roads that are transportable by buses. That's a big issue. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Linda Mailani. Hi, I'm Linda Mailani. I'm a big proponent of public education. I went all my years through public school, all the way to UC Berkeley, and big, big believer in that. Although I could afford to send my kid to private school, I didn't because I believe I want him to experience diversity. So despite my child in elementary school, he was in a portable classroom for grade three, four, and five in a house that we specifically moved for the school district that's so crowded, he's not, he had to pick between an umbrella or a jacket because it's so crowded and so, and that's fine, and he's had accidents because to run from the portable to that one door you're allowed to open to get to the school bathroom as a third grader. So, we doesn't matter, I say, you know what? Teachers are great, I believe in public education. I voted with my time, we give money, volunteer our school, on average, $25,000 a year raised by the foundation, which a third is given to all Portland. And I wholeheartedly support that. Those who are fortunate enough, definitely vote with your dollars and support that. So middle school. Now we are in middle school. We definitely work with enrollment department to get all the sixth graders into West Selvin. Now it's 966 kids in a hallway so crowded, they're not allowed to carry backpacks during passing time. So as of, um, this week, 120 students that still don't have lockers. The buses were late, up to a half an hour for our first six weeks of school. And we put up with a lot because if our principal are dealing with the infrastructure and, oh, and then the bathroom don't get clean because there's two janitors on disability. So I'm now, as a proponent of public school, I'm losing faith. And I am concerned and I feel like I need to speak up at this point for my child and for our community, which we feel like we have been really voting strongly with our high ta tax property taxes that we pay, along with money that we earn, we very specifically donate to our schools. So four points I wanna say, please consider safety, please consider education quality, not just equality, is it a better education for all? Not privileged, not underprivileged, is it better for all? And commute. Please think about commute as real, realistic geographic considerations. A river is very, very important. It's not a crow. Our kids don't have wings. They cannot fly. <laughs> and lastly, community. So please do not treat your, all your properties like a fleet of properties that you're trying to fight and fit tenants into. These are students, these are lives, and these are all of our futures, including yours. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, I, uh, I missed our timeline by 20 minutes. Uh, this is the third time DBRAC has ever finished late. I apologize for that. And Jason, any final word? Can I, can I? Uh, I, uh, people in the public in the back ask that you make it clear what the decision was that came out of the committee's vote. Could you restate that, please? Uh, yes, it was. Uh, for option A, uh, meaning to reaffirm DBRAC's position in the framework and direct staff not to generate a soft boundary model scenario at this time. And there were two abstentions and everyone else was for option A. We're adjourned, thank you. Folks, um, 
Uh, custodians are in in-service all day tomorrow because schools are closed. If you could help us move your chairs to the carriers, we would greatly appreciate it. Thanks for being here tonight.